and we are in, again, Galatians 3. I'll be reading 13 through 14 and 17 through 29. Christ redeemed us from the things, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham may come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jumping down to 17. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer depends on the promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why, then, was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law had given through the law given through angels and were entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness should certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ, may be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed, so that the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we may be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The word of the Lord. Good morning, church. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Kylie. I was here with you guys last week, and I'm so excited to be here with you again today. Uh, Since I was here last week, I feel like maybe you don't feel this way. I feel like we're friends now. So I would love to start this morning with a question. This is a deep, hard-hitting question. In fact, so deep that I don't even want you to tell the neighbor next to you your answer to this question. I just want you to, like, lock it up in your heart, okay? You ready for the question? Is there one superior grocery store? One grocery store that you know stands out among every other grocery store as the one, the one that you can always go to, the one that you can always count on. Is there one true superior grocery store? Maybe you would say that the answer is like Meyer or Walmart, Kroger, Trader Joe's, Target, like whatever your answer is. My answer is Aldi, but we can move past that pretty quickly because I don't want the judgment. I, if you are a budget bestie in the room, you get it. And I know that I cannot get everything on my list when I go to Aldi and I have to go to another grocery store afterwards, but we sacrifice a lot for the things that we love, right? So Aldi would be my choice, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture like you are going to shop at your favorite grocery store, okay? Like really put yourself into this experience. What side of the store do you park on? Which door do you go in? What do you see? What do you smell as you walk into the space? Do you have a pattern that you follow in and out of the aisles? Do you have a list that you're reading or are you just winging it, right? Like, put yourself in the grocery store, okay? Now, I want you to imagine that something feels a little bit off about this experience, okay? As you walk in the grocery store, you go about your routine, you notice that nothing is actually in the place that it's supposed to be, right? You know your store. You know where it's supposed to be. In fact, it seems like everything that they sell is on a completely random shelf all throughout the store. There is a can of soup next to deodorant, next to mechanical pencils, like all on one shelf. You can't even find two of the same thing in one spot. What is that experience like for you as a shopper? Like, I would do grocery pickup every time. Like, I'm not messing around with that, right? What is that experience like for you as a shopper? It's probably frustrating, right? It's probably chaotic. Like, I wish that there was, like, some signage, right? Like, why can they not just, like, put a sign here, maybe group some of the like items together, have a little bit of categorization, right? Like, I wish 
there was some organization, some categorization, some division. And I wonder if division in some ways can be a good thing. Division is sometimes the dependability, the predictability, the structure that we need in our lives. But unity, on the other hand, sometimes it's chaotic. It has blurry lines. There's no rules. It kind of feels like a free-for-all, right? And I wonder if sometimes division is a good thing. In fact, I think you can make a case for division in a lot of ways. We divide classrooms by age to accommodate development. We divide sports teams by skill levels for fair competition, right? But I think we've also seen the ways that division can damage. A world at war tears apart infrastructure, costs people their lives. Politics can turn hostile over party alignment, right? But you could say the same for unity as well. Unity is beautiful when a family or a community or a church come together for a like cause, a just cause, like justice and mercy, but unity can also be damaging. Our world is a witness to the way that people have unified over the wrong cause and the wrong mission and caused things like discrimination and oppression and segregation. So maybe you've seen this firsthand. Maybe you've been diminished or left scarred or left challenged by harsh lines of division or radical displays of unity. Maybe your community feels divided in this political climate, like it's signs in the front yard season, right? Like you know that there's going to be division come November in the people that you love and how they choose to vote. Or maybe you've experienced it in your family when it comes to the issue of division around pronouns and who am I supposed to love and am I going to be supported in the decision that I make or not. Maybe you've experienced the harsh unity. People have been unified in an untrue opinion of you and it's causing lies and rumors and slander. Maybe you feel like the world has united and put a label on you and your people and where you come from, and it feels unfair. Division and unity. Two concepts filled to the brim with nuances and beauty and messiness and history over generations. The source of all of our problems and potentially the answer to all of our problems could lie in these two words. So which one's the answer? Division or unity? This is where we find ourselves today in the book of Galatians in chapter 3. As a church, over the past couple of weeks, we've been walking through the book of Galatians, specifically chapters 1 and 2, and we know that this letter is written to this semi-unknown area called Galatia by a man named Paul. And in the first couple of chapters, he sets up the problem. The problem is that there's a false gospel that has permeated the church and it's causing this rift between Jews and Gentiles. So this practice of circumcision, they said, was necessary for any man to be considered authentically male. But what that led people to believe was not only was Jesus for your salvation, but there were other things required in order for you to be saved. And Paul is adamant to fight this mindset that salvation comes through works, and he wants to redirect the focus back onto the saving work of Jesus. And that's where we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you? by the works of the law or by believing what you heard. 
So Paul begins, begins with a really strong phrase, like, you foolish Galatians, which after the dinner party scandal of last week, if you were here, like, we should know Paul is not afraid to speak it how it is, right? He's been doing it the entire letter. So that phrase doesn't interest me as much as the question that comes after it. He says, who has bewitched you? which is a really strong word. And that word bewitched is exactly as it sounds. It's that idea of being put under a spell. So Paul's talking to them as if they have been put under some sort of spell that's making it difficult for them to see things clearly. So what is this thing that's bewitching them? And I think to answer that question, we should probably understand better the context in which this entire letter is written. So the cultural landscape of the church at the time is very divided, especially between Jews and Gentiles. So Jews on one hand, they hold tightly to the Old Testament scriptures, they observe the law, they follow the rules to live holy before God. There is ancestry. You can trace their ancestry back to the first Christians that ever existed. That's the Jews. And the Gentiles, on the other hand, those are non-Jews. So those are people from other geographical regions, mostly Greek, and they have deep history of worshiping other gods and vastly different religious practices. But you see, this divide is more than just religion, because in the ancient Near East, there's very little separation between religious and ethnic identity. So this idea that we have today of a personal relationship with God and choosing how you want to worship and where you want to worship based on your own preference really wasn't existing at this time. Your religion was in direct correlation to your national and ethnic identity because it's passed down to you through generations. So this message of freedom in Jesus Christ is spreading like wildfire because of the efforts of church planters and apostles everywhere. But now, not only do the Jewish people know and worship Jesus Christ, but the Gentile people are starting to as well. The true gospel was not just converting people's religion, but it was now welcoming people of all ethnicities and cultural backgrounds to the table. So imagine the tension. Like, who's truly considered the people of God? Because these Gentile people are hearing a message of freedom in Jesus Christ that they've never heard before. And they're excited and they're ready to drop everything and sacrifice everything to follow God. But the Jewish people are probably thinking, hold on a minute. Like, we we have rules, we have laws, we have lineage, we have things that we are meant to keep pure and we are meant to keep holy. Like, where's, where's the division? How do, we, how do we find a middle ground? And I know there's a lot of nuance to this specific situation, but do you see any similarities between this and our world? Like, whether that's on a small scale, like the pride that we show to our home team and them getting to the Super Bowl, right? Like, it's worth you calling your uncle to rant about the game afterwards if you win. But also on a a larger scale, America is described as the melting pot. We have cultural integration for centuries coming into our world. You rub shoulders every single day with people that are different from you in a million ways. And I wonder if you took a really close look at your life, are there seeds of division being planted? Maybe it's in your life, or maybe it's in the life of a neighbor, or a family member, or a coworker, or a friend. This is so much more than a mean girl's like, you can't sit with us kind of moment, right, between these two groups. The divide between these groups was causing discrimination and oppression and pride in the Jewish identity as part of God's chosen people, so much so that the Jewish people would have looked at Gentiles and hated them, or at the very least, shown favoritism towards their own people. And Paul describes this entire cultural moment as having the Galatians bewitched. They're so focused on following the law and keeping the purity that it's causing them not only to view themselves differently, but to view others differently and to no longer have a clear picture of who Jesus is and what he died for. That's why he says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. It's like you're under a spell. How are you not able to see this clearly? 
That's where we find ourselves in the landscape of this letter. And then after asking a few hard-hitting questions, Paul tries really adamantly to put the spirit in opposition in comparison to the flesh to hopefully help them see that it's Jesus who saved them. And then he brings in a man named Abraham in verses 6 through 9. So read along with me. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Hopefully you hear the key word in there. It's by faith. And to me, Abraham maybe feels like a little bit of a throwback. I don't know. He's like, he's digging way back into the lineage of the Jewish people, right? He's going all the way back to their roots. And we maybe know the story of Abraham because it's found in Genesis, the very first book of our Bible, where this man named Abraham was called by God to leave everything that he knew, to leave his people, to move to a foreign and distant land without any idea what God was going to be doing, and he said yes out of obedience. And then this is what God says to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and, may, and you will be a blessing. So maybe this idea, this story rings a bell from when you were younger. I know it does for me because we used to sing the song that Father Abraham had many sons, right? Many sons had Father Abraham. It's this idea that he's making us into a nation. And then the beautiful part of the, that song is, I'm one of them and so are you. So we can all just praise the Lord, right? Like maybe you know that song, but he made a promise to Abraham that he's going to build the entire nation of Israel on his lineage alone. The Jewish people love Abraham. He is their ancestor. But Paul actually flips the script on them because he quotes Genesis 15. Abraham believed in God, and that was his righteousness. So those who have faith are children of God. It was by faith that Abraham followed the call of God to a new and foreign land. So it's now faith that is going to characterize every single descendant of Abraham. So the important link to him was not the link of genetics. It was not the link of works. It was the link of faith. That means that the true inheritance, the true people of God are not just the Jewish people who were circumcised and followed every single rule and fought to keep their lineage holy. It was now available to the Gentile people. Anyone who chose to respond in faith could receive the promise of the Spirit. The table is now wide open. So if you're like me, you're thinking, yay for the Gentiles, right? Like, come on home. But that's probably not what the Jewish people were thinking. I kind of think of it like living with someone that you've never lived with or someone new for the very first time, right? Maybe you've experienced this. You've gone from like somewhat independent living or just living with your parents to living with somebody new. Maybe this was a college roommate or a post-college roommate. Maybe you got married and moved in with your spouse for the first time. Or maybe you just have somebody that's living with you for a while, right? You can know how hard is it to reconcile differences in a shared space. Like, why on earth would you think that the ketchup goes in the pantry and not the fridge after you open it? Or we have laundry baskets for a reason. Like, why are your clothes not in the basket but on the floor next to it? Or if you, girl, if you think that picture is going on that wall, you need some glasses because it's not cute. Or whatever you're doing in the kitchen, can you stop because it smells weird? And I'm like trying to focus on the thing that I'm focusing on, right? Like living with people that you've never lived with is hard. So how do we do this when there are bigger, more significant differences at stake. For the Jews, it's how are we meant to live in peace with the Gentiles when everything in our law says that we are meant to be pure and holy? How do we work with someone whose political alignment rubs up against our deep felt values and beliefs? Like, how do we lean in and love well and listen well when there are vast disagreements on immigration and the sanctity of life and how to keep peace in our world? 
Or how do I love someone well when I didn't realize when I married them that their view of family is so different and they want to set different boundaries with our extended family and they want to raise our kids differently than I want to? Or how do we stand in the gap for marginalized people when our nation has incredibly deep roots of discrimination? How are we supposed to step into that gap? Like, I want to be unified with the people around me, right? I want us to live in harmony. I want to look at my neighbor and see them and love them despite their differences. But am I not also called to stand on the truth? To stand on the word of God, to fight for what I know is right so that my kids can be raised in a world where there is peace and that they can go to sleep at night with peace knowing that their world is right? How do I do both? How do I do it in a way that honors God and honors others? Division and unity. There doesn't seem to be an easy answer. So, what is the answer? Paul continues in Galatians 3, starting in verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. And take special note of verses 13 and 14. They're important. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So I think in these verses especially, we can see why Paul is so adamant that the Jewish people cannot live by the works of the law anymore because the law had become this wedge that was dividing people. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 7 because he says that the law requires that we do everything to keep it. And nobody can achieve that level of perfection. The curse of the law was that it made so many demands that it requires striving and working on our own effort to keep it. But Jesus Christ took that curse and he turned it into a blessing. He took the weight of working to gain our righteousness and working to be right before God and he took it all on himself when he died on the cross. But wouldn't it be just like Satan to take something that Jesus put a death to and try to resurrect it for evil in our lives? Wouldn't that be just like the enemy, to take something that God had given the Jewish people as a gift and to convince them that it was ultimate, that it was above everything? Wouldn't it be just like the enemy to take something that was meant to keep them pure and holy and for him to turn it and spin it into something that kept them divided from anybody who thought, acted, worshipped differently than them? And the same enemy that was dividing the people of God back then is trying to divide the people of God today. He wants us to divide over difference of opinion He wants us to divide over preference. He wants us to divide over appearance. He wants us to divide over language barriers. He wants us to divide over how much money is in our bank accounts. He wants us to divide over age and over gender. But the things that God gave us that make us unique and that make us beautiful when we were created in his image, the enemy wants to take those differences and make them into a divide so that we turn against one another and we use them as weapons to damage one another. That's what the enemy's doing in this divide, but the thing that unifies us, the thing that unifies us is not a thing, it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to heal our divides and to unify us through him, and the enemy wants nothing more than to lead us into hostility towards one another. He wants us to reject God. He wants us to reject our neighbor. But the work of Christ abolishes harmful divides. Here's how Amy Mantravati says it. She says, Indeed, 
the work of Christ that abolished the enmity between us and God, if properly understood and appreciated, will naturally lead us to show grace to those around us and desire the abolition of all forms of enmity. How could we not respond to grace with grace? How could we not respond to grace with grace? So if the law is this curse, if the law is the thing back then that was dividing them, why was the law given in the first place? And that's what Paul spends most of verses 15 all the way through pretty much 23 is describing the way that Jesus Christ came as a blessing to fulfill the curse of the law. So let's jump to Galatians 3 starting in, or starting in verse 23. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So, you see, the law did serve a purpose. I know I've spent a lot of time the past couple of weeks telling us how the law was this evil, horrible, wretched thing, but it actually was given as a gift from God. The people of Jesus, the people of Christ, God's people, they needed parameters for them to know what it was like to live with God's expectations. So the word in this passage, guardian, is actually the word for like a babysitter or a nanny, right? Like the law was just meant to keep us in line while the parents were away. But it was also meant that the law would keep Israel from straying to worship false gods in neighboring nations, and it protected them from idolatry. But they took the parameters of keeping them from worshiping other gods, and they used them to keep them set apart from anybody who was different from them in every single way. But now that Jesus has come, we don't need a guardian in the law because he has become our guardian. It's the Spirit of God that lives within us that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So now that the harsh dividing lines of, uni- or of division are gone, we have a new call to unity, which he describes in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is good news today, church. In Christ Jesus, we are children of faith. Faith in Jesus is what unites us. There are a million things in our world that divide us. Cultural background, gender, socioeconomic status, age, the color that you claim when you vote or the color of your skin. And everywhere we look, we can find a reason to draw harsh dividing lines. We can find ways to draw lines where there's inferiority in some and superiority in others. But Paul says that in Christ... There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female. The invitation in Christ is to trade the harsh lines that divide us and to notice our differences and celebrate them in unity. Charles Cousar says, in light of this, The unity that he declares in this passage is not one in the first instance in which ethnic, social, and sexual differences vanish, but one in which the barriers, the hostility, the chauvinism, and the sense of superiority and inferiority between respective categories are, look at that word, destroyed. We are celebrated as unique individuals in Scripture. Psalm 139 says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. For your works are wonderful. I know that full well. In 1 Corinthians 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, and so it is with Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, 
but many. The things that make us beautiful and unique individuals do not vanish in the light of unity, but the enemy will take advantage of any of our differences to draw those harsh dividing lines, lines that give birth to hostility and barriers and chauvinism and racism in the lives of non-believers and believers alike. It's sin that causes hostility towards others. It's sin that causes division. It's sin that is injustice towards those who don't act, think, work, worship, or live like we do. The gospel calls us to put to death the sins of hostility and division in the body of Christ. Friends, this was the heart of Jesus. We see it in the way that he lived his life. He sought out the marginalized people. He sat around tables with the elite and the outsider. He knew the names of the lost and broken people. He went to find a Samaritan, a non-Jewish woman at a well. And even though she tried to point out their differences, he says, I don't care. I offer you living water. He stopped a woman from being caught in, caught in adultery, from being stoned. He went to the house of a tax collector to eat with them. This is the heart of our Father. This is the heart of our Savior. And today... Can I say that if there is somebody who has oppressed you or discriminated or wronged you or made you feel less than because of the way that you are just different from them, and if they did it in the name of Jesus, please know that just because they were speaking his name does not mean they were acting with his heart and he grieves with you. And we grieve with you. That's not the heart of Jesus. We can see a vision of what God has planned and designed for us in Romans or in Revelation 7. It says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and standing before the Lamb. If you belong to Christ, you are an heir to the promise, you are a child of God. From every nation and tribe and people and language, you are welcomed before the throne. So what's the answer? Division or unity? I think we can see in the letter of Galatians that we have unity in Christ, but I actually think the answer was revealed long before us in the very words of Jesus himself. Because before he left this earth, he offered up a prayer to the church, a prayer for all of us who would come after. And here's his prayer for you today in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even, even as you have loved me. The heart of Jesus is that we would be unified, celebrating our differences in a way that is a witness to the world. Notice that he says our unity as a family of God is so that the world will know the message that Jesus loves them. And my goal today is not to make you feel guilty if the Spirit's stirring anything in you for any memory you have of no matter how long it was of the time that you failed to love somebody that was different from you. Right? My goal is not to make you feel guilty. My goal is for us to see in the room today that we have a mission Yes, we're meant to be set apart from the people or from the people of the world. We are meant to look different from the world around us, but that doesn't mean we're meant to be apart from them. We're meant to love them as Jesus would have loved them. In the church, we have this word sanctification. And sanctification is just the process of continually being made holy before God. It's believing that we have never arrived at perfection, right? We are constantly being made into the image of God. And as we use that word, we often use it in a really personal way, right? Like, I am being sanctified. Jesus is sanctifying me. But I also believe that this call to unity, this mission, is 
corporate sanctification? How are we being made holy as a body of people? What is God wanting to do in us in that? We have a mission for unity as the church. One in which we look different and we act different because we worship Jesus. We're set apart from the world, but we're still in the world, loving people, showing them Jesus, showing them what true unity and celebrating our differences can look like. You see, I, uh, I love my job as a youth pastor. That's what I get to do 40 hours of my week. I love hanging out with youth and eating horrible food and listening to all of the pop culture drama that they all know when they walk in the door. Like this, it's, my, it's the best gig in the world. I love it. But nothing makes me more upset than when I hear the way that people talk badly about the next generation. I hate, I hate, which I don't know if I should hate, but I hate the phrasing and the language that they're lazy that they're apathetic, that they don't want real jobs, they just want to be TikTok famous, right? That they're too into their phones, they're too into their technology, they are the anxious generation. And I wish that I could just take the people who are believing those things about the next generation and let them sit in a circle with my 6th and 7th and 8th graders who are talking about fulfilling their kingdom purpose and how to love and serve one another because they are the future of the church and they have it right And sure, you could make a lot, you could use a lot of statistics to back up a lot of those claims that I mentioned earlier, but we also know about the next generation, that they are one of the most justice-oriented generations that we have ever seen. They want to participate in making the world a better place. That's why I love them. And I was reminded of this, I was actually at the Carmel Library this weekend, and um, there was a display of a project that was done by students, it was called the Clothesline Project, where they could design a t-shirt with a message written to a survivor of violence, specifically domestic violence, but any kind of violence. And I took pictures of some of my favorite phrases and quotes that they wrote, and I want to share a couple of them with you. These are written by students. Love shouldn't hurt. Pain is real, but so is hope. You are not the darkness you endured. You are the light that refused to surrender. You see... I want to pursue unity. I see it as my mission for them. Because I want the next generation to grow up in a world where they can look at adults and see the example of what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus, showing justice and mercy to the people around them, and celebrating their differences. Because I don't want to hand them the mantle. I don't want to hand them a world that's lost and broken and damaged, and they believe that they can do nothing about them. I want to empower them to speak out for the causes of justice and mercy. I pursue the mission of unity for them so that we can sit in the future of the church and know that it's in incredibly good hands. And today, I don't know what makes this message personal for you. Maybe it's the school that you work at or wherever you work. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your family, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother. Maybe it's you yourself. You have a mission that you want the world to be a better place. You want it to be unified. And today, I want to invite you to ask the Spirit to make it personal. That we as a church have a mission for unity. That it's faith in Jesus that unites us. And in a world that is so divided, if we can stand as a community of believers celebrating and recognizing our differences, but saying that those differences are not a reason for harsh, dividing lines, then the world is going to ask the question, who is Jesus? And why does any of this matter? I see the way that you live differently. Who is Jesus? What is his mission? Today, I want to invite you to join in the mission. We have a mission for unity. And I want to leave us with a quote today from Derwin Gray. It was used in the first week of this series. It says, The gospel not only forgives us our sins, but it creates a family with different colored skins. I hope you see the mission of unity as your mission today. It's what Jesus is calling us into. So let me pray for us today. God, we 
thank you that we were created in the image of God, that we were created in the image of a holy and matchless and perfect creator. But God, we know and recognize today that we are sinful and fallen human beings that everywhere we look in our world, there's the opportunity to find division, to find ways that we are not alike from the people next to us, to treat people differently because of it. But today I pray, Jesus, that starting here in this room, we would be a group of people that feels the mission so heavy, so burdened on their heart that we would walk out of these doors and show the world a different reality where we can be celebrated in our differences, but we can be unified in the message of Christ. Would you give us the faith to believe that it's possible? God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room today. Would you make it personal, Jesus? Would you heal the pain that exists in the stories of the people of this room? Would you give us a hope for a future, a new picture of what could be in our world? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.